Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so, um, so she, uh, Lizzie uh, drawings for me, that's his name, to a crowd where he tells that he started a new hotel business. Turns out that uh, when he comes to tell the truth, it's actually a um, upscale problem and, um, to a shock. And, you know, she's sort of about to just turn on him, but he is a very persuasive spiel that convinces her because he sort of, um, he sort of gives her something to do. He said, you be in charge of making sure these women are treated well. Now, how could she say that? And if she turns it back, then she's sort of refusing to help the women. And um, so she says yes. Then, um, mysteriously, Emmy is killed. And then Daisy disappears. So when the case comes to uh, Emma, the question is, who killed Femi, and where is Ngozi? Now, her, Ngozi's dad was a friend of the director of the agency where Edna works. Um, his name is Soa. And um, Ngozi's dad and Soa were actually classmates in college. So when his dad disappears in Nigeria, he follows, thinking that he's probably coming to Ghana, and then she, he comes to Soa and asks if he would please help because the police said that he was able to find him. So, Tim is definitely not on the on, on, on the side because we don't know, number one, if it goes in the light, and number two, or what is she doing? And if she's like, why, what kind of state is she in, and how can we rescue her? But, even though this seemed to be like a, and, and by the way, it didn't really seem like a, a, a regular kidnapping case because there was no ransom demand. Um, so, if that's the case, then where is Nicosi and what's happened to her? Um, but then, as, as Emma starts to investigate, she comes across a, a huge network that is like way bigger than she even imagined of um, sex and human traffickers. And although, you know, she points a few um, landmarks, uh, that's done. Across. So that's where um, that's where um, Femi and Ngozi come from Nigeria. That's here, and they come over here. And then Emma is also in Accra. But then she discovers that as she learns more about this network, not only is this is Femi part of you know, just managing this so-called upscale model, he's also involved with much more um, widespread human trafficking. And the way it goes is, um, most, most of the people who are on these um, trafficking expeditions are Nigerian. And the, what happens is, you know, desperately poor people and you, you will see how this happens in the book. Come to them and say, well, you know, how would you like a beautiful life in Europe, in Italy? They say the streets are like golden, and you can get a job in a salon, or you could be like a toy operator, or um, things like that. Yeah. Oh, and they give you three months, three to three, but no place in the experience is free. No one in this world. And so they're just like, yes, really. And they pers- very persuasively, it's not cheap though. It's like 500 apiece. And they tell you 500. But they don't tell you that that's the only thing that they will be paying. Because, in fact, what happens is, Here's where they're going to get the book. To get there, they've got to go from here to Nigeria, which is, uh, here's a staging um, point for called Agadez. From there, they cross the desert to this place called Seda in Libya. And then they go across here to Tripoli, and then they get a boat. Now, when, when you say it that way, it sounds kind of straightforward, but there are a lot of different problems. Number one, this is not going to be a legal crossing, so you have to have smugglers 
So this route is really long, and I can't you have to face up here yet. So most of these people do come to other days. So now, now that I have this sort of structure going on, the question is how do we find out about these places? I've never been to Niger. I've never been to, you know, actually I have been to Niger, but that was a real little kid. And of course, the Ghana is where I grew up, so that was not the issue. Now, these two countries, Nigeria and Niger, whether um, deliberately or justifiably or unjustifiably, have really bad reputations. Nigeria is known as um, the kidnapping. Uh, I guess capital of West Africa. There's a lot of kidnapping that goes on for ransom. Um, and it's very, very common. Um, but Niger was just, that was another story I liked to go. This, um, when you go home, you can just try to um, Google Niger. You will see a lot of sites, including the State Department, that says, unless you absolutely have to travel to, to Niger, do not go there. So I'm thinking, oh, this is nice. <laughs> so then I'm just sort of conjuring up in my mind, you know, armed guards protecting me and, and things like that. And so I think I was more anxious about Niger than Nigeria. So the thing is, to get to these places, you need to um, guides, people who are local. So I, I managed to point to two brothers who have a uh, Lagos here, who have a, um, uh, a guide, um, it's called, they, they give you a customized um, travel um, exploration around the different countries. And I told them that I'm really interested in interviewing people who have survived the journey from uh, Nigeria and, and returned. And so they made special arrangements and they changed the, you know, the schedule and the, uh, the whole list of places that we were going to go and they adapted it so that um, um, I, I could meet these people. In Nigeria, I met, oh, oh, well, it was interesting, we went to this place called, um, it was in, oh, it was in the main city, the main city, See, this is Lagos right here, and then Benin City is somewhere there. And that's where most of the um, the Marcos come from, that, that particular city. And um, I went to, we went to an office called Arnett, which is the National Association for Protection of um, uh, Migrant uh, Survivors, or something like that. And that was a very, uh, really strange interview because I started. I went with the two, uh, two guides, and, and I was having a question with a lady who told us we, would, we could come in and speak to her about it. And I was asking, so what are some of the things that the, the um, you know, the survivors of all the sex work, the things that they go through? And all of a sudden, I have to catch into like two or three, three questions. She suddenly sort of turned away from me and looked at you know, the two that are doing that, and said, at this point, I refuse to answer any further questions. You may leave. Huh? What are we doing? <laughs> What's the strangest thing? We didn't figure it out. It was like, either we weren't dressed in three-piece suits, which is a stupid thing in hot Nigeria, <laughs> or we didn't, you know, slip right out of the couch. <laughs> that would have done it. We better get all the information we wanted. So now my, my two uh, Nigerian guys were kind of like, in the spot because now I have no way to interview. So I don't know how they did it. They somehow wrestled up one man and five women who actually had made the trip from Nigeria as far as, um, as far as seven. I don't think they got to Tripoli. No, one got to Tripoli and then the others didn't. So they got as far as that, and then, but they just couldn't hack it and, and they came back. So they told me, you know, their story. And it's a very highway story from Agadores to Saba across that desert. It may look short on the map, but this is miles and miles of desert. Hot, hot desert. And, and some, some people never make it. 
people do have pollution or there's another thing that happens is they, they try to have a big truck that's hanging them. Imagine like an F-150 and they pack about anything from 20 to 30 people in the bed. And the people who are, are, are along the edge, you know, they, they dangle their legs over the side. And there are these wooden sticks that they're supposed to hold on to. But what happens is sometimes some of them are so exhausted they fall asleep for a second and they fall out. And they're warned at the beginning of the trip if you fall out, they're not stopping for you. Because we cannot afford to stop. Why? Because they're bandits, roving, roving bandits through the desert. We cannot afford to stop. And um, one of the women told me, related to me, that um, she joined the group of 22 to um, get to Libya. And she said, by the time we got there, there were 10. That means 12 of them died on route. And, and one of the women actually had a baby that she was taking. Why? Because when she got to have a baby, she had to work as a sex worker and then she got pregnant. So now she has a baby. She, but she still wants to go to Europe. So she took a baby with her. Can you imagine what that's like? Terrifying. <laughs> Terrifying. But they made it. They made it. And they made it back as well. And, um, so it was really very helpful uh, talking to these women. I also talked to a group of um, four men who had also made the trip. The men is a little bit different. Black Africans are, are highly favored for you know, very physical um, work, manual work. The Libyans don't actually like the Africans themselves. They like the way they work hard. <laughs> it's a fair, uh, well, I think we understand that here in, 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 in the States in some way. We like how you can work, but we just don't like you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so some of them did a lot of, um, uh, you know, job manual jobs, things like that. But here's the deal. If you are caught, if you are caught crossing into Libya by the authorities, they take you to a detention facility. Facility, and these detention facilities are hell on earth. They're like big warehouses where they pack 200 to 300 of these uh, captured people. But there are no toilets. The toilets. And I saw a video of this, and I was a contender with the people I was interviewing. There were two buckets, buckets, for 200 people. They're not given anything to wash the area down. The buckets are overflowing. It's just disgusting. Can't treat people like that. Worse than that is that some people, some of the men who are considered, you know, really expendable, that He's never going to make it to Italy anyway. We dispose of them. Mm -hmm. And there are going some ways in which they dispose of them. They're probably going to go into them right now. But they can also be killed. So, so you've got this double jeopardy thing. If you do get to Libya, you've got to watch out because you might get captured. And if you get captured, the problem is what they do is they try to force you into you know, call them back to your parents and say, to, to say, send me money, send me money, send me money. And if you can't, they usually, they usually take it out on you physically by, you know, with beating you and things like that. Um, so, but it's very interesting. One of the guys in the interview, he said he had done it twice and he said he was going to try for a third time. He's determined. And I think we see that too from you know, in Mexico to the States. A lot of people who are like return after they send that back right back. But I think some of them they know them by you know, hey, I'll take you back <laughs> um, so it, it it was a different picture for the men and the women. Now, Alcatraz itself is a very, um, it's a very dry area. Most, it's very monochromatic. But the sand is sort of a tan beige color. And then all the buildings are made out of the material, the stones, and the sand. So they have the same color, too. It's so different from, you know, like, say, a coastal country like that, where there's color and, you know, bright colors everywhere. And it's, this is very monochromatic. And, um, I don't know, some people might uh, find it kind of um, depressing in some ways. But the, the, the most amazing 
amazing thing about the Pijur is that once I got there, the first thing was I met I was in the Vietnamese, which was the um, people. So I landed there, and I got a beautiful airport, by the way. So as I came out, I was in this sort of readiness state for all these digital entities and all the men that might be hanging around. And what should I do? It's like, what? I see like ordinary people doing ordinary things, meeting ordinary people. Where are these uh, bandits and stuff? We get in the car. All I see is people on mopeds, <laughs> or these uh, three three wheeled uh, taxis, yellow taxis, the, the ones that look like what they use in, in the East and East and Asia. You know, riding around, but, 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 you know, the grand speed of what I don't know, five miles an hour. Who are these bandits who are kidnapping people? And where do you keep keep the kids? Like, I was so shocked, but I was also a little bit ashamed because I had, I had sort of just fallen for all I'd seen on, on the internet. And you see, here's, here's what the issue is. When you want to write something about this um, letter, what you do, you, you Google it, and you find somebody who says, Niger is a very, very dangerous place to not go there. So then you write that in your blog. Niger is a very, very dangerous place. Don't go there. So the next person takes your blog and does the same thing. So you, what you do is you get these um, descriptions from people who have never actually been there. We just read that it was a dangerous place. Now here's the truth of the matter. There are some skirmishes between uh, a Niger and Mali, um, you know, sort of um, uh, these uh, extremists, um, uh, Muslim extremists, and then some between Nigeria and Niger. But the whole country is not at war. You're painting the whole country with a broad brush when the, the skirmishes are in limited areas. So, you know, when I wrote my blog, I said, the, the country the West loves to hate. Because it, it really was not fair. These people, this is one of the poorest countries in, in West Africa, in the world. I want to know which of these rich people you are robbing. Because there aren't any. There are a few expatriates who are like, you know, live behind you know, walls and, and, and mansions. But most people are poor. And so it, you just have people sort of struggling to make a living, right? Um, you won't see a gun on the street like you might see here. <laughs> because, of course, they're illegal. And you don't see people fighting or anything. As a matter of fact, when you pass somebody in the street, the Quran says that you must greet them. And so you have to say, Assalamu alaikum, and the person says, Assalamu alaikum, in response. And, and you know, the, the guy that I had there, his name was Ibrahim, he said, uh, he said, you know, never, never pass a person and don't, and don't greet them. So I was thinking to myself, like, you know when you get an intern elevator in the U.S., and everybody just stares stonily at the door, and no one says a word, no good morning, nothing. <laughs> it's a sort of the opposite of that. So, even if it's a stranger, you must greet a stranger, and that's the way. So, what I had here was a very friendly place with no fighting, kidnapping, or anything. And the food was good, too. <laughs> but the hotel, the hotel I stayed with in London was like a five star, and they updated me to. A sweet, oh my God, this gorgeous. <laughs> and the thing about international travel is that if you get a five star in international travel, it's far, far above the average hotel here. Um, like, let's say a four star here would not compete with a five star in, in Africa, for example. Because the money is, a lot of money, money is sunk into it because it's catered to expatriates who have the bucks. And that's how, that's how it works. So that was a really beautiful place. All the days, um, much poorer, of course. Um, the hotel was not quite as good as but it was, it was pleasant. Um, and the, what, what happened was, um, I went, uh, I have to tell you a story about it. I went to the, um, it's called the, 
Japan, the livestock market where they have goats, cows, sheep, uh, what else? Uh, donkeys for sale. Uh, whether it's you know as a as a work animal or, or for food. And um, I was I was kind of standing there. I saw this cute little um, girl with a hat. She looked at me and in pure terror took off. Right? Well, because I've probably never seen a person in the front of me. <laughs> I'm even back to you, but I'm not back to them. <laughs> I am totally not black. Um, so I was, I was like, wow, oh, someone's actually terrified of me. <laughs> An African is terrified of me. It's amazing. So, uh, one of the things that happened when I was in other days was <laughs> my, my, um, my guide, he then said we're going to his village, which is outside of town, and there was out of other days, and then he would show me the desert and everything. I was like, oh, okay, cool, cool. I was a really excited trip. I came out to the, the vehicle <laughs> where they were going to take me, and he then was sitting in there already, and I said, uh, this is what we're doing. And I totally trash dashed up <laughs> truck with the handle barely staying on. And I got in there and said, uh, is that AC? And the driver turned around and said, no AC, no AC. <laughs> it was like about, so Iran looked at the me around as we were driving away in this blast of hot air with like blowing over me. And he said, oh, why? Wait, it looks so happy. I said, no, because it's about 2,000 degrees here. <laughs> it was so hot. Whew. But anyway, when we finally came to our, um, our um, camping place, we, um, we, we set up shop there, and he brought, him, um, he brought out this folded, folding bed. He said, this is your bed you can sleep on. And he covered, he covered it with a blanket. I don't know, it's a pink pants, a blanket. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and then he cooked. He cooked some lentil soup, which was really good. You know how he cooked it? He did like the old, the real old-fashioned way. He got uh, was it flint? I made a spark and it caught the light to you know the, the bush that he said. I said, oh, so you can actually do that? It's real. It's not like in the movies. <laughs> I was like amazed. I was stunned. And he did it so easily, too. So, um, and then first, of course, we had to have, uh, you know, tea. And mint tea is very popular in, in Muslim countries, and it's always very sweet. Uh, so we had some mint tea. And then he then told me that um, the desert gets very, very cold at night. I said, are you sure? I saw a good him like, Five to one, which is which is the currency that I said. Um, if if I if I find it cold, I'll give you five to one. If it's still hot, you give me five to one. So so we got set to go to bed. You know, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock. I'm waiting for this cold to come. It's hot to this <laughs> The breeze that blows is like hot. So there I am. Um, you know. Shirt off and just praying for some coolness. And then I looked over at Ibrahim, he was covered over, wrapped in a cloth. I said, This is a poetry <laughs> Oh, so the next morning, he just to say, I said, Yeah, you know, we five you. <laughs> but um, it's just, you know, just perspective. When you're used to temperatures that go up to like 120, 130, 140, you know, if it drip, drops down to 80 at night, I guess that's cool. Um, so, and then the next morning, you know, as we were getting ready to go, the guy who said to me, um, he said, um, let's have some tea before we go. I wanted to go back to other days before it got too hot. And so he said, let's have some tea. So I returned the, the I returned the, um, the, um, the favor. I said, no, no tea, no tea. <laughs> and then I said, uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't want to go back when it was three in the afternoon. I wanted to get back there, so you know, by about eight, I was back in the middle of and spared all the all the, the real heat. Um, but yeah, it was it was uh, literally sleeping under the stars because um, there, there was no tent. I mean, kind of bad, bad because the tent would probably be really hot. Um, but I mean, you could see all the stars. It was really quite quite amazing. 
Um, so then, um, I was there like uh, five or six days or so. No, I think a week. And then it was, then the next place I was going to go to was now I was to Canada. And um, so, I need to get a, a plane from Canada's to Miami. And then from Miami, I would fly to Lome and then to Accra. Um, so, the way, the way the plane goes, it's kind of like a shuttle. It actually goes around this way. So, it's not a direct connection. They go around this way and they pick up people on the way. So, you know, they, they land and take off. And then, as we got to, I think, one, I think it was called Mutu or something, a, a, a town right here. I was sitting in the, the cabin waiting for people to board. And I saw the pilot and some other engineers kind of looking up at the wing at the engine and saying, like, oh, that doesn't look good. <laughs> oh, we have to tell you there's a missing part on the plane. There was a part, and so I don't know where it dropped, uh, maybe on the way, <laughs> but there was a missing part on the plane, and they would have to probably get it shipped um, from the morning. And I said, oh, well, oh, you mean like um, this afternoon, this evening? No, 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 days, we're talking days. <laughs> we're not going to get anything in a few hours. So I said, oh, well, what are we supposed to do? I have, I have to catch a plane. Tomorrow morning from the end. So the lady, the lady put said, Well, what we'll do is we'll provide a brand transportation for you on um, uh, uh, um, an SUV. And um, I said, How long does it take about? She said, well, Usually about six hours or so. So I, I got in with a, one other guy in the back and one, and one passenger in the front, that's the driver. And I mean, it's quite comfortable, nice SUV with air conditioning and all, all that. And um, plenty of room until. Somebody knocked on my window. I opened the door. He said, Yeah, I'm coming too. So, of course, now what happened? I was right in the middle. This guy sat on my side, and I had one on the side. And um, the vehicle had one of those humps, you know, in the middle. So, my knees were up here with my backpack on me. And um, then the guy was on the right side. He kept falling asleep. I'm leaving the So after a while, you're not getting like a sharp job and she can wake up and go the other way. But the thing is, this so called six hour journey, when the, the tour operator you know, who was stationed in there, I mean, he called the job and he said, What the hell is going on? Why do you have my, you know, my uh, client, my customer driving? So he explained the situation with the, with the plane and everything. And um, then he said, I expect you to arrive by at least 10 p.m. in Miami because he will stay overnight at the hotel. The driver laughed. He said, Who am I getting dead before 5 a.m.? 5 a.m. So I was, I was in that vehicle 15 hours so in that position. <laughs> if I don't know what it is. Um, it was really something. We made two stops in, uh, you know, a couple of villages. I mean, just just the thought of how how much you know place can be misrepresented. There were some kids around me. Um, I mean, they were begging for bread from me, bread just to eat. They're not robbing you. They just want to survive. I mean, that broke my heart. No kids should be begging for just, you know, more sort of bread on the street. It's, it's awful. It's awful. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, there were so many things about it that really broke my heart. And I, I developed a you know, kind, of, kind of fondness for the place because I think it's the people that make the place. And everybody was so very kind and hospitable. And I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm really happy about that. So what happened was, and the driver was right, we didn't make it to the moment before 5 a.m. was Dublin. So when I pulled into the, um, the hotel, <laughs> my plan was going like at 8 a.m. <laughs> so then, I'll just go up, have a shower, and I'll be right back down to check out. Oh, I said, I couldn't enjoy this beautiful suite. But they kept the suite for me. It's like, oh. 
a rough place because the madam is there as well. The madam who is there does the same kind of thing, getting money from um, her sex workers, it, you know, 70, 70, 30 percent or 80, 20 percent. And if you don't, you know, bring in enough money every day or every week, whatever it is, the arrangement, um, you know, they'll be held to pay. They, they could pick you up or they could just like, you know, pick you. And they have the, the, the men there who can do that. Um, but I also heard that the man himself um, was also quite vicious. She apparently stabbed one of the, the sex workers when she couldn't produce uh, enough uh, money for that week, enough earnings for that week. So, no joke, no joke. And then the question you asked is well, why can't they? Just to escape. Well, where are they going to go? They have no money. Um, they have no contacts because they're from Nigeria. They um, have no passport. Where are they going to go? So you're kind of stuck. So you say, okay, well, I'll try and work this. And, but then you just you discover that. Well, no, you're working like this for five times how long. But there's another route now. There are more men who are getting very sophisticated. And these are the these are ones who have a little bit, bit more means or um, more resources. They use, they simply use, instead of having a minimum uh, person like a madam or a pimp, they use their phones exclusively. So it's a direct contact with the customer. They, there's several uh, sex sites you can go online. Just call the woman that you that, that is your fantasy, and she will arrange to meet you wherever. Um, and then afterwards, uh, you pay uh, once it's up. Well, no, you have to pay before the act. Um, even even that is not entirely safe because there are of course brutal customers as well who try to beat up the women and it can be punished. But the thing about it is that that has reduced the power of people like pimps and madams who, you know, are predatory. And, um, and the women who 
just not coming in to of uh, sex work. I, I generally have um, better quality, um, better appearing, cleaner, and so on. Um, so now, in, in my book, there's, there's a madam uh, who owns uh, this hotel called uh, The Alligator. But her male partner has a brand new hotel, which is the one family is going to manage. And um, it's a very beautiful building, lovely rooms, and the idea is to get, you know, only at state clients like ministers of parliament, policemen, uh, university professors, that kind of, you know, not, not some Joe Blow from the street, but just word of mouth, you know, and have you know, very quality people who can pay, and really pay. Um, so, just to do a scale, um, in, in general, it's a, a sex worker is charging an uh, expansion of like, say, uh, British, Lebanese, American, German, or Dutch. They would usually charge something like that, 200 dollars an hour, dollars, not, not the local currency, but dollars. And then over there, it might be like 600 dollars or so. Those would not be the same rates that they would try to say necessarily for a, a local person. But when, when it's somebody from abroad, they really, you know, take advantage of it. And, um, I mean, you know, why? There's, the market is there, so why not? And, um, so, uh, once I visited uh, there, I went to another area of, of the town where it's called Bigger. I'm not really sure why, but anyway, it's a sort of like swap meet area, lot of, lots of um, clients, lots of sex workers milling around. There's a whole taxi system where, you know, as soon as uh, somebody engages a sex worker, they get into the, the cab and the cab takes them to whichever hotel and then they, I'm not sure if they get paid directly or they get a cut, I'm not sure. But it's a very orchestrated um, system that goes on. And um, it, was, it was a little bit overwhelming to me. Uh, a lot of noise, dust, smells, uh, it's really quite overwhelming. And it's in this it's in this environment that Emma goes on the ground to try and find out if they know where Ngozi is. Because what happened was, Ngozi met a young woman who had just started at the Alligator Hotel, and she saw that she had been brutalized, so Ngozi decided she was going to rescue her. So she rescued Ngozi and took her back to where Femi was uh, they were living in one house. And he went ballistic. He said, that's, that's their, their income. You just stole one of their workers. And so she's like, well, I don't care because I'm not leaving her to be brutalized there. And then Femi just blew a fuse. And it was from then that things sort of went downhill. And then Gozi basically and Femi became separated. But then where is in those years, but is the question. Um, so the 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 bottom line is that there is a there's a lot of intrigue going on with this murder, this pins up in Gozi and how it ties into all of this um, sex trafficking. Um, and the the funny thing about it is that um, you, you kind of see this evolution of Ngozi as, you know, sort of a wide eyed sort of naive young woman who starts growing up really fast because she now realizes, realizes what's going on. And um, so we, we, you, you have to read it to find out whether she's alive or dead. Um, <laughs> And let's see what else was, was there. I think that, that basically covered um, everything in the, in the three different countries. But as you can see, it's a, it's a totally different scene in each of them. It's not homogeneous at all. It's totally different. And so you'll find the descriptions of the, the different the different countries quite uh, starkly different because they really are different. You've got like a very sparsely populated poor country.
indeed kind of densely populated um, trade rich country um, in the Jewish people have all that oil. And then you've got Ghana, who also, which also has oil, but in terms of security, uh, safety, and stuff like that, I, I don't say it's 100%, but it's, it's a lot better than Nigeria. I, I, I wouldn't hesitate to walk around and say at night in Ghana, but I would never do it in Nigeria because um, Americans are, are kidnapping targets. And you could be walking along the street and somebody just pull up and pull you in, and that's the end of that. Um, so, let's see what is that anything else I could think of that I did. Um, well, maybe I have a, a few questions that might jog my memory or so I'm thinking of that I came across. Before COVID, it was uh, once or twice a year. I missed uh, 2020. I went back to 2021. I missed 2022 completely. I nearly returned August and um, August of uh, this year, 2023. But in general, it was once or twice. Uh, it, it gets a little expensive, so I would say once um, a year at least. And then sometimes it's the book I'm writing or the book I'm going to write. I mean, occasionally the book I've written and I need to add some stuff. But I, I've been relying uh, much more with my, um, I know two private investigators there, and they have a lot of resources. They can go to places that I need to describe. They take photos and they, and they just send them to me. So in the book I'm presently writing, which is in the journal number four, I probably will not need that much stuff. Um, uh, it's only said in Ghana, and there's not going to be anything spectacular about the, the setting. So I may, I may not need to even uh, research the present book, but I know that it will be it will be a lot simpler than, than this one for sure. Um, so yeah, that was that was the number of. Um, and by the way, I just want to mention that um, I did I did go to one, uh, one trip in a crowd, but then I went up north to um, a place called the Malay um, uh, Malay uh, um, Wildlife Park, the uh, Wildlife Reserve. Uh, the, the, you know, you usually think of East Africa, have a little bit of friends and the big cats and so on. But actually, um, uh, Ghana has a quite a substantial population of elephants in the northern part. And um, I went to this fabulous resort. It was incredible. I must have guilty of how that was, of course. Um, and but they, uh, I went on a tour twice and, and saw those. You could stare at elephants all day and never get tired. They just want to adjust to it, the way they, they move, the way they. You know, use their trunk and play in the water, and oh, it's just so wonderful experience. So, other animals like, you know, different antelope, and my favorite uh, other animal, the warthogs, warthogs are everywhere. And um, um, the, the elephants are, are the stars of the, of, 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 so if you're ever thinking of um, going up there, I highly recommend it. It's called the, the Zena, um, Zena Hotel, I think it is. Very nice. Um, and then you have another person. <laughs> okay, my, my father passed. Well, actually, both my parents have passed. Um, no, that's okay. Um, he, he, my father never got to see uh, any, of my, any of my books, unfortunately. Uh, my mom did up to, I think, I think the last Darko. No, no, I'm sorry. No, she, she saw um, the first two on as, as well. So, um, she, she passed in 20, yeah, 20, 2020, yeah. So she did, she did see, she did see, yes, she would have seen the, um, and the number one and the, and the number two. Um, <laughs> my mind, my mind was kind of funny. My page is saying nothing at all. <laughs> if she doesn't 
he still tell you. But he makes no comment to me. Real good, bro. I'm real good. <laughs> so I presume she uh, approved because she was not a doctor of praise. Let's just put it that way. I was out with uh, three, uh, three brothers. One lives in Sweden and the other two live on the, the east, uh, the east coast, and, and they've they've read all of um, my books, and and they all have their their favorites. Um, my oldest brother, he's such a fast reader. When I came up with my first darker book uh, called um, Life of the Gods, he um, he read it cover to cover. He went to bed confidently, but he said he read it cover to cover in four hours. I spent one year on this novel, and you read it in four hours. This is not justice. But yeah, he's a very, very, very fast reader. Um, and oh, yes, another a question related to that is how, you know, Ganesh feel about the book. More and more Canadians are getting access to them, and one of the reasons is that there's now a bit, an English publisher who um, publishes um, an English version, and it's much cheaper to export to Canada from the UK. Um, U.S. to Ghana is very prohibitive in cost. So there are more of them reading more and more. And, and I now have quite a few fans, actually, uh, in Ghana who, who really love the books. And um, people always ask me, since I'm always down on, on, on the, the, the Ghana Police Service, whether um, they ever expressed any, uh, you know, resentments of what, how I describe them. I said, they don't read the book. <laughs> and, and just to prove it, I've actually given these books as gifts to them. One of the, the commissions I gave the book to, hey, this is the book he had. And, and then he did this. Where's the money? <laughs> oh, I was so naive back then. Because I actually wanted, I wanted permission to go with the crime scene unit to um, crime scenes. And I was, back then I was so naive, I didn't realize that, you know, my novel would not be... You know, novel reading is not that great in Ghana. It's better in Nigeria, but it's not that great in And, it, and novel stories don't have that kind of, um, you know, reputation, hard hitting, dramatic, or whatever the word is. It's just a book. So, if I had known, I would have put a little something in there. And I probably would have gotten onto the crime scene in it. But otherwise, no. We'll make it as difficult as possible until we pull it out some cash. <laughs> I went to, to the post office and I spent like two hours sending a box, a package to back to the U.S. And one of my friends said, oh, did you give the guy anything? No. That's why it took you two hours. <laughs> you gave him something, you'd be out of bed in 15 minutes. What's the matter with you? So yeah, you have to learn the ways. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was, that was, that was that, um, on that, um, occasion. Uh, but yeah, and the others. Oh, no, no, it's right, man. Hmm? It didn't die. Read it again, it doesn't actually say he died. Yeah, no, Darko Arthur is coming back in 2025. Yeah. Um, because I have, I actually get this question at least twice a week from people visiting my, my blog or Instagram. They all ask when is Darko coming back. And I didn't actually know that Darko had all these groupies. I didn't know he had so many groupies. <laughs> I had no idea. Um, but yeah, they, they are die-hard Darko fans, man. They want him back. 
And uh, so I, I need, and although, you know, so the press are really, really pleased with the MS series, I'm going to have to tell them, you know what, they're going to kill me if I don't write one more dark, or at least one more. So I'm going to try for 2025. Let's see, but uh, I haven't decided what he'll do, but I, I have an idea. Um, but yeah, he will be coming back. It's like the way they resurrected uh, Sherlock Holmes after everybody objected to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle killing him off. People were furious. And Arthur Conan Doyle himself said, Oh my God, I'm so tired of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> but people wouldn't let him have it. It's like, Oh no, you, you, you got to bring him back. So he did. Um, but yeah, he hopefully will come back. No, 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 not at all. See, what happened was, when I wrote Death Penalty Space, which is the fifth one, I introduced a new um, a female assistant. Uh, so I don't, uh, what was her name? Oh, yes, Mabel Safo was going to be her name. And so there was going to be like a spin off. I would have her solving mysteries, but that Jericho would be kind of like maybe a mentor or directing her or something. But you see, Soho inherited the Darko series from um, Penguin Random House, and um, I know they've always sort of never felt it was their own, and um, there were Julia Crane's, my editor, was always sort of like giving hints about, uh, you know, having their own series. And so when I, I gave him this plan of, of having um, uh, Mabel Sato as a, uh, a spin-off, she said, hey, if you're going to write in a new character, just write a new series. And you know what, she was right. He was talking like a real pain in the ass, to be, to be honest with you. He said, he said, it can be difficult. So, and you know, his technique is totally different than, than, than the Edmund. So, that's how Edmund Jan was born. But the funny thing about it is that it coincided, that was around like 20, 16, 17, 18, it coincided with the whole Me Too movement at, around that time. And it's very funny, Emma Jan was. It was almost like a Me Too creation, almost. Um, because, you know, a lot of us, especially men, had new sensitivities about all the crap we men have to go through almost every day. And it had me looking at things differently, and I think it sort of had me, that's when I knew I was ready to write a, a female character. And um, it's very funny, I always feel a lot more relaxed when I'm writing in my <laughs> When I'm writing dark, I'm a little tense, so I don't make it. But I guess it could be another man, and then, you know, we have this whole discussion thing going on. So, <laughs> I do get tense with him, but Emma is a very relaxing person. I mean, she's the kind of woman I just like to hang out with, you know, just to uh, shoot the breeze, but she's just so, so much fun. And, and you know, she has a, a kind of sharpness, it's, it's very disarming. Uh, you may not realize that, you know, she's on to you, and you know, things like that. And I, I kind of like that, you know, where, you know, she springs a surprise and it's like, wow, how did you figure that out? So, yeah. So, and then one person asked me if any Darko could ever meet. I said, oh, no, that's not us. It's going to complicate things. It, it just wouldn't be right. It just wouldn't work. But yeah, I, will, I, I really want to bring a Darko back. And even if it's not the final one, at least give people a little bit of a Darko fix, you know. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. I know. It was fun. It might have. I don't know if I was in a mood that I just, I wanted to kind of stir things up a little bit and for the experience, I didn't know what it was going to. One woman wrote to me, she said, I'm really disgusted with you. <laughs> how dare you? I mean, she said, how dare you do this? I said, wow, I had no idea. <laughs> So yeah, I, I I owe it to a lot of people to, to bring it back. So and I think after the fourth, um, I think it'd be okay to just you know, do one um, one dark hole, uh, and then if necessary, I think it's I could switch back. But yeah, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm ready to go back to dark hole. And you know, I think it also allows him to mature a little bit. His kids will be not grown now. 
um, to be maybe instead of being active in the field, he might be you know, teaching at the police academy or something. And my thought was somebody wants him to come back to detecting, and he says, no, I'm not going through that again just because of the trauma I suffered with this attack. And um, but something's going to you know, compel him to, to do it. And so that's, that's the basic idea I have for the 2024. Like a, a different Marco who wants a little quiet now, but you know, somebody's begging him, please, you're the only one who can solve this, something like that. And then nobody. So yeah, so I look forward to that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> Yeah, so. Um, any other questions? Okay, so the, the one I'm writing now, hopefully for 2024, it's called, it's called the Whitewash Tomb. And I don't know if you're um, a Bible, uh, how should I put it, a, a, a Bible wonk. But that's actually from a. Um, um, a quote, I think it was Paul to the Corinthian uh, Revelations, and um, I think he was, he was talking about the Pharisees or something, and he said, um, on the outside they appear like whitewashed tomb, but inside they are full of filth. And in this story, what happens is that um, there's a murder of um, an LGBTQ uh, activist. Uh, and it all surrounds this um, consideration that the Ghana government is now um, bringing up into Parliament a bill called the, let me see if I get right, the, uh, the bill for proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values. And in this bill, they will criminalize all LGBTQ people, whether it's suspected or somebody just accuses them. Um, you can get up to 10 years if you in any way support LGBTQ um, organizations. Um, uh, if, if you fail to report something, you could be criminalized. And I'm mean, like, what is wrong with you people? When did the news get like this? And because of that bill, there's been a marked in, increase of hate crimes against LGBTQ people in the country, especially in Accra. People getting beaten in the street within, you know, this length, this bit of their the, the life. And my feeling is, like, this is so unbelievable. Why are you people doing this? And you know what it is, of course. It's all religion. And some of it is coming from a, an organization called the World Congress of Families. This is a very far-right um, American U.S. organization that's supported by a lot of the, um, the very, I think it's, uh, what's it, uh, American, I guess, no, what is it? I forgot the name, but anyway, it's one of those, those far-right groups. And they have been active in Uganda, Canada, and Nigeria in urging anti-gay bills to be passed because, you know, this is, this is a sin against God or whatever. But, you know, the Pope said, he said, okay, you think it's a sin, but it's not a crime. You don't criminalize people for this. You may take it as a sin. But, you know, people are going around sinning all, all over, you know. This is not the only sin we got. And so... Again, this is going to be a social issue that, that I'm, I'm choosing, you know, as a backdrop for um, my books, which I, I usually do. So, again, another world, another different world for a completely different world. And um, um, I think, I'd say it's going, it's going quite well. The book is going quite well. I, I should be done end of March. So. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. And then maybe I could start working on the darker one. Yeah, I think I'm done. Did you have a Okay! <laughs> well, welcome, people. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if you want to 
let me do some signing or did any of you have any other questions or anything? Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys all so much for joining us in store and online. Can I get a round of applause for the author? And we are going to move on now to our author signing uh, in store. And remember that if you order online, you can get a signed copy from us from the event today. Thank you all so much for joining us at Mysterious Galaxy.